Madam Zelenska, First Lady of Ukraine, it's a great honor to have you at our annual meeting in Davos. Thank you for coming. We know it has been a difficult journey. It's been almost a year since Russia invaded your country, sparking a war that has cost far too many Ukrainian lives. Tens of thousands, many of them civilians, many of them children. The largest refugee crisis in the 21st century and millions internally displaced. Amid this profound crisis, Ukrainians have stood strong in common cause, galvanized by the leadership of President Zelensky and yourself, Madam First Lady. It has inspired many around the world and in this room. Madam Zelenska, since the beginning of the war, you have been an ambassador and advocate for your country and its people. You have been a powerful voice in global capitals and have worked tirelessly to address the human impact of the war. Helping people access healthcare, mental care, education, and other resources they need during this difficult time. Your leadership is ensuring Ukraine and Ukrainians are stronger today and are on a path for even a stronger tomorrow. We are very eager to hear from you on what lies ahead. Madam Zelenska, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. What's on your phones? So. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, the representatives of the world who are here today in Europe, in Switzerland, in Davos. Please take a look at this hall and see the number and the kind of people here. The number and the kind of the people who will be taking part in the events of this forum. Heads of states, chiefs of international organizations, business leaders, prominent economists, public figures, journalists and scientists. People have influence for entire industries, for nations and for the world as a whole. You're all united by the fact that you are really very influential. But there's also something that separates you. And that is that not all of you are using this influence. Or sometimes you use it in a way that divides even more. A meeting such as the Davos Forum exists because deep inside we all believe that there is no global problem that the humanity, that the mankind would not be able to resolve. We have enough energy and strength for it. The sum of our um, combined influence is bigger than the weight of existing challenges. But for there to be a sum, we need to, um, to add its components, its parts, and that's global cooperation. And it is all the more important right now when Russia's aggression in Europe makes various challenges facing the world and wraps them into one large-scale crisis. The, we are facing a threat of a collapse of the world as we know it, the, the, the way that we are accustomed to it, or to, to what we aspire. What can be life in a world where tanks are allowed to, hit, to strike at nuclear power stations? 
What will happen to inflation when state borders start to collapse and the integrity of countries will be trampled on by those who want it? What will happen to the cost of living when millions, not millions, but tens of millions of people will be forced to flee a mass starvation and will become refugees? How does the world want to achieve climate neutrality if so far it hasn't even stopped the burning of entire cities in Ukraine. This is what Russia is doing with its artillery, with its missiles, with its Iranian drones. And you know that the Russian aggression was never intended to restrict itself to the Ukrainian borders. This war can go further and it, it make a crisis wider if the aggressor does not lose. In other words, if the sum of our influence does not outweigh the aggression. Ladies and gentlemen, my husband, the president of Ukraine, when he addressed the leaders of 19 states who are economically the most powerful, offered them of, and, and to the whole world a formula about how we can become the most powerful in peacekeeping. It's a 10-point plan. It's 10 points about how we outweigh the Russian aggression and how we prevent existing regional and global crisis from converging into one full-scale, uh, full-on global crisis. I want to emphasize that these points are not purely political. Each one of them has a tangible human dimension. This is the dimension of parents who are crying in an ICU where doctors are trying to, to fight for the life of their wounded child. Or a boy whose family was shot by the occupiers as they were trying to evacuate. This is the dimension of farmers who are afraid to go back to their fields because the mines have been scattered uh, all over these fields by the occupiers. This is the dimension of people who have lost their homes and are forced to seek shelter wherever they can be accepted. I ask you to look at the need uh, to stop this aggression exactly like this, with the eyes of the people whose lives have been um, brought into chaos by the um, uh, aggressor country. When we talk about the peace formula, when, when we talk about radiation nuclear safety, what we mean is that we cannot allow a new Chernobyl to happen. We do not want children somewhere in the world to be forced to learn how to protect themselves from radiation disease. When in the peace formula we talk about food security, what we mean is that there's a right to food that every human being has, and it's an insult for mankind and for human nature itself that in the 21st century it is possible for us to have mass uh, starvation. Uh, simply because uh, because there is a targeted aggression because of, uh, of some country. When we talk about energy security, we mean that no child in the world should have to do their homework by candlelight, like children in Ukraine are doing, that no doctor would have to perform surgeries in the light of flashlights as recently in Kyiv and Lviv. For me, the most painful point of the formula is the release of all the prisoners and deportees. These thousands upon thousands of Ukrainians who have been deported to Russia and who are being lied to, that no one is going to help them. They're not the only ones being tortured. Their families are also tortured by uncertainty. These are also thousands of children that we must protect from the dissolution of their bond with their motherland, which is exactly what Russia is doing when, they, uh, when it puts up thousands of Ukrainian children uh, by, uh, for adoption by Russian families. And this is not just an attempt by Russia to wipe the memory of these children about who they are. It's a crime against the very sense of parenthood, against that primeval bond between the mother and a child and father and child. Everyone has a right to life. So a separate point of the peace formula is the withdrawal of Russian troops from the entire sovereign territory of Ukraine. 
and thus guaranteed cessation of hostilities and terror by the occupiers against Ukrainians. This will restore the force of international law and the UN Charter. Purely from the human point of view, in these occupied territories, these are our people in these territories who have been torn apart from their families and they're waiting for liberation. And while they're waiting, millions of people are experiencing the fear uh, uh, and the Russian repression. Another point of the formula is justice. This is what the dignity of each person that died under the rubble of its, his or her own home demands of us. It's what uh, uh, children and adults who've lost their limbs because of Russian strike, strikes demand of us. Everyone who was trying to survive in the basement of Mariupol while Russian shells and bombs were evaporating their city. Everyone who was yearning for salvation in Bucha, hiding from Russian executioners. Justice is needed so that no one in the world would ever think that war crimes and genocidal policies can go unpunished. It's not what the living and the dead Ukrainians need. It's needed by the world, because no one should think that this violence can be repeated again. The peace formula returns security not only to people. If you've seen the scorched earth from the Russian strikes, the burnt forests, the closed off areas because of the thousands of mines, we can see what kind of a traumatized environment we can leave to the next generations. And I constantly try to convey that in Ukraine there is no place which is completely safe, and unfortunately also you can't take a day off from war. Everyone who is now in Ukraine has to risk his or her life every day. There is nothing off limits for Russia as we speak. In our city of Dnipro, people are still working on, and working uh, and sorting through the debris of a residential area of a, a house that was destroyed by an anti-ship missile. This missile was built to destroy aircraft carriers and was used against the civilian infrastructure. This morning we heard about 43 uh, casualties. When we since we started this forum, uh, it, it grew to 43 casualties. These were people, ordinary people, at home on a Saturday. And that's enough reason for Russia to kill. And that's why the ninth point of our formula is about guaranteed non-escalation. And of course, at some point, we have to pronounce an end to this war, not only so we have a date, so that we can reset the time and start counting peacetime, because peace does not equal a truce. It's so that our people can return home, who are scattered around the world right now, so that our fathers, our mothers, sons and daughters can return from the front line, for families to reunite, the families that were torn apart by the war. Ladies and gentlemen, unity is what brings peace back. And today I would like to hand over to my colleagues, my, my counterparts um, of the forum, uh, letters from the President of Ukraine to Mr. Alan Verset, the President of the Swiss Confederation, to Mrs. Ursula von der Leyen, the President of the European Commission, and also a letter addressed to, to Mr. Xi Jinping, the head of the uh, People's Republic of China. I hand it over to Mr. Liu He, the, the Vice Premier of the State Council of China. There's an old saying, if people come together, they can move even Mount Taishan. Uh, and we believe that the world will unite for peace. Ukraine has already received answers, some positive answers from many of uh, heads of states about their readiness to work together on the um, peace formula. This year may not become the year of the polycrisis that we hear about if it becomes a year of the Ukrainian peace formula, which will come true. Thank you. Glory to Ukraine.